So welcome folks. Um, this is uh, part of Edu Wiki Education speaker series. Um, and I'm just going to uh, do a, a quick throw up a slide and talk about what Wiki Education does, and then we'll dive into the program. Um, so screen share like this. And um, at Wiki Education, um, we support writing assignments in undergraduate and graduate courses. So if you're teaching and you have an interest in having your students research and write for Wikipedia, we are still accepting courses for the fall term. And we've got a whole lot of resources to support these Wikipedia writing projects, and it's free. So check out teach.wikiedu.org. We also teach Zoom-based courses on how to contribute to Wikipedia and to Wikidata. And you can go to learn.wikiedu org to get the details about those and we work with institutions who want to sponsor one or more of our wikipedia or wikidata courses for their staff or their constituents to focus on a particular topic area uh, so if our work sounds like the kind of thing your institution should get involved with check out partner.wikiedu.org um, and with that uh, i'm going to introduce our panelists um, so we have uh, with us, Bob Cummings. Um, Bob is um, a longtime uh, participant in the Wikipedia community, and he's been pioneering Wikipedia assignments in his writing classes and exploring how it can be used in college writing instruction for well over a decade now. Um, we have Stephen Harrison. Um, a journalist and lawyer who's lately been on the Wikipedia beat and I've really enjoyed reading uh, his reporting on the Wikipedia community and how it's uh, started to grapple with AI. And we have Aaron Hafaker, um, a renowned uh, uh, AI researcher who uh, developed many of the uh, AI tools at the Wikimedia Foundation that the Wikipedia community still uses today. And now he's doing um, AI related research uh, at Microsoft. Um, so uh, welcome panelists. And um, why did I lose my window here with my notes? Oh, there it is, ha ha ha. Um, so to start us off, um, Bob, um, can you talk about how you're thinking about generative AI from the perspective of a writing teacher? Like, how has it played out in the classroom so far? And how is AI starting to fit into the big picture of developing writing skills? Yeah, well, thank you, Sage. Uh, thanks for uh, hosting this and inviting me to participate. You know, it, I teach at the University of Mississippi, and our Department of Writing and Rhetoric has been very collaborative and a little bit out front on engaging AI. So we've been working within the classroom since last fall. Um, and our general approach to generative AI has to encourage our students to engage it, to understand it, and to try to bring it into their projects. Um, and to do that, we kind of have a general process where we look at different generative AI products, try to figure out collaboratively with our students what they would might be best used for in the writing project that's ahead of us, and then scope the engagement that we're going to have with it. So for instance, we might think one tool is good for summary. We might think another tool is good for producing counter arguments. We might think another tool is good for locating sources. And so we design and in, to integrate those generative AI products um, around that narrow or narrower capacity. And then we invite students to bring that in if they like the product, if they like the results and they think it fits into their writing project, um, they can bring it in. They need to cite to it. Um, and we always provide space in the writing process for reflection. So we ask students to reflect on the use of the tools, reflect on how they have engaged them, reflect on uh, you know, whether they would want to use them again. There's a lot really that we're learning from those reflections. So that's been our approach. It's had some bumps. Really, one of the major challenges has been the tools iterate so quickly that you may design an assignment around the idea of a specific engagement and it turns out um, that uh, tool may have changed. Um, 
So generally speaking, we've been actively engaging it. We try to help our students understand the tools as best as they can. Um, and that's been our local approach. Now, I think uh, in higher ed generally, there's been a lot of um, discussion and maybe consternation, which was uh, uh, at, at the current time, there's been a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about an article that came out in the Chronicle of Higher Education just, uh, I think, a couple of days ago from an English professor that said that um, basically, essentially, the argument was this English professor at Case Western was making Clune, I believe is his name, uh, was that um, grade inflation has long been a problem and students are very used to turning in essays that are merely competent. That's not exactly his language, um, but and uh, uh, AI is just really going to empower them to do with to do more of that. And so um, that's sort of a frame that I've heard from faculty. One of the hats that I wear at the University of Mississippi is I work with our Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And so when we, we've we talked to faculty for, for a year now about these tools, and I sort of see three camps uh, in the faculty generally on our campus. One is, I don't want anything to do with this, and I forbid it in my class. A second is, Sort of like, well, let's explore it. I want to give you some guardrails and uh, don't go outside the zone that I'm defining. And then the last camp really is like, hey, let's just jump in and explore this together. Um, and I think most faculty, in my experience and in my impression, are in that first camp. They're sort of saying, I don't really want to deal with this, and I don't want you to turn in assignments that engage uh, generative AI. And I'll say one last thing as I wrap up, because I don't want to go on for the whole hour, but um, there's a big difference between writing to learn and writing to report learning. And so in formats where writing to report learning is being used, uh, you know, assessments, right? Um, generative AI is, is really a problem for faculty because generative AI is not going to is going to serve as a way to uh, distance them from their students' thinking. Um, however, I have the great fortune of being a writing teacher, and so much of what we do is writing to learn. And in the writing to learn context, we feel like not only can AI be utilized, but it's also our responsibility to help our students understand it because it will certainly be something used in their jobs when they leave us. So that's kind of where things are right now. Happy to expand more later, but I'll turn over the mic. Thanks, Bob. Um, one of the things that is sort of comes up for me uh, as the, the parent of some like middle school age children is um, trying to help them learn to neither write to learn or write to demonstrate learning, but more like write to communicate. And so find ways to communicate that really do give a sense of themselves coming across, um, which is definitely not uh, what happens when they when they try to use AI for that kind of thing. But that's what I've tried to be start emphasizing with my kids as they grapple with, well, how do I just do this thing that I that I need to do for writing? Um, great. Um, so Stephen, um, you've been on the Wikipedia beat for a little while, and uh, you've taken an interest in this intersection of generative AI and Wikipedia. Um, what do you find interesting here, and what has the response from the Wikipedia community been like? Yeah, thanks, Sage. Well, first of all, I'd say the thing that I find most interesting is just kind of the circularity. And just to kind of step back a little bit, we have Wikipedia content that editors have created and curated over the years, and they've curated it from reliable sources. Um, newspaper examples or newspaper articles, for example. And so that's creative Wikipedia. And now the chat GBT and all the AI tools have been trained on Wikipedia by, by all accounts, Wikipedia is like usually one of the largest data sets. And then now the question is whether the output of chat GPT generative AI should, should go into Wikipedia uh, to create new articles. And, you know, let's assume that some of that is happening. And then those new articles appear on Wikipedia or new content appears on Wikipedia. And that we all know journalists, uh, I'm a journalist myself, w Wikipedia is very much used by journalists to write articles. And so you could have journalists who are using content that's on Wikipedia that came from the AI 
uh, to, to write their articles. And so there's a circularity there. We could talk about whether that's a good or a bad circularity there, but that's just the thing that I find most interesting about this entire um, discussion. But it, you also asked about uh, what's the reaction been from the Wikipedia editing community? And I kind of say that I'm gonna use Bob's Bob's language, that there, there are different camps. And I think one camp is in the highly skeptical um, side of things from the Wikipedia community. And that group, some of them have even called for like an outright ban on, on Wikipedia or on, on generative AI and large, large language models being used in Wikipedia. And I think they raised some really good points. I mean, first of all, there's the hallucination issue. We've all heard how ChatGPT makes things up. And if you ask it to write a Wikipedia article on a topic, it's um, you know going to both make up facts in many cases, and it'll generate fake sources that don't exist, that look look real, but then you look on them, search for them, and those sources don't actually exist. And so that we, we got the misinformation problem there uh, that comes from chat GPT or AI tools when you generate. And then you also have the copyright issue that's been raised a lot that these um, these AI models have been trained on a lot of the materials that are copyrighted, and, and there's still a lot of question there uh, as far as copyright concerns and their use. But I think there's also this second camp, and that's the more practical camp. And and those editors are saying, hey, uh, you know, these tools are already being used anyway by some editors uh, in in adding them onto, you know, creating content for Wikipedia, maybe formulating sentences. Uh, one example that I find really interesting, and and it might be kind of historic in a way, was the article on artwork title. Um, a Wikipedia editor, username Pharos, um, used mostly ChatGPT. Uh, to create the content of this article. And uh, people who are online, they can look it up if you want to. I think th this editor was telling me they needed the chat GPT to kind of provide some activation energy to just get started because chat GPT would provide some sort of general language. It kind of gave the formatting of Wik Wikipedia article and it helped um, it helped with creating the uh, just kind of the first draft. And then there was pretty pretty strong backlash from the community saying, hey, we need to mark this. This is before certain policies were in place. And um, you can see that kind of in the talk page discussion that's behind the page. So where is the Wikipedia editing community landed? They've kind of landed um, in terms of policy. There is now a large language model policy. And the way I think of it, kind of my brain, is it's a take care and declare framework that if a user uses ChatGPT or some AI tool to help them with adding content to an article, one, they need to take responsibility for it, much like a bot or any other automated tool on Wikipedia. They need to take responsibility. They need to vet it. They need to verify it. They can't take, you know, what was created by ChatGPT at face value. And then um, they also uh, declare it needs to be in the uh, edit history for the article that they have added um, that this content was generated with an AI tool and that it's made publicly available to everyone that way. And so it'll be interesting to see how that works. I think that, you know, that's that's probably a good step. I, I'm, I'm be interested to see how long the declare mindset at last, because it might be that the, sort of the assumption at some point will be that uh, the, the content was in part used, you know, created with a AI tool. But for now, I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's sort of a very responsible policy that both um, it should be, you know, made clear to the public and that the user should take, you know, total responsibility for for adding content with ChatGPT or an AI tool. And it's correct, still on the proposed stage. Um, you, you can see that at the top of the um, of the link. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, Aaron, um, I know you've been keeping up with the literature. And so as machine learning researchers explore the next generation of AI that are kind of being built on top of the big general purpose language models, um, how is AI going to work differently in the near future? Yeah, so I uh, I hope you'll forgive me. I actually put together a few slides um, uh, for this because I, I wanted to rapidly go through a few things that I think are going to sensitize us to other ways to look at how language models can work in the context of Wikipedia. So uh, as I as I like to oh yeah let me let me start with a little bit of my introduction. So if you go to my my Wikipedia page. Um, uh, I actually have a couple gadgets that pull in some predictions. These are things that I, I used to work on at the Wikimedia Foundation. So for example, we can classify me. So I'm, I'm very much in the area of STEM. I'm a person. Um, I definitely like 
I don't know why I talk about internet culture, but I guess, you know, I, I, I write about Wikipedia, so maybe that's internet culture. Definitely computing technology. This is one of the topic models that I built when I worked for the Wikimedia Foundation. And on the upper right, we can see a uh, quality prediction. So it predicts that the article about me is C-class um, and uh, so people use this in Wikipedia to get work done, to route articles for review, that sort of stuff. Anyway, that was my old work in Wikipedia. Now I work for uh, Microsoft, as, as Sage said, I do a lot of work with language models. So I wanna start us at the very basic, like what the, what the heck is this language model doing? So imagine that we come to a language model and we say, I have a lovely. Um, essentially what it's doing is it's trying to figure out what are the probabilities of like the next word that's gonna come after this. So uh, bunch has a very high probability, 2016 and little have relatively low probabilities. And so then we fill in the word bunch uh, and we ask, okay, well, what's the next word? Coconuts, lovely bunch of bananas, lovely bunch of monkeys. It's most likely going to be coconuts. And this is all that a language model is really doing is it's trying to figure out what, what word is most likely to come next and then fill that one in and move on to the next word. And so this was essentially what old GPT-3 was. It was trained on the common crawl, which is basically the internet and all available digitized texts. Um, uh, after that, there was some research that came out where they essentially took GPT-3 that was just trained to predict the next word, but they gave it 1 million examples of following instructions. And that's what gave us GPT-3.5. And this made a huge difference. So with old school GPT-3, if you gave it like, hey, what's the purpose of this C code? Old style GPT-3 would tell you something that's not very helpful. Oh, it's storing some values in an array, I guess. But if you give it to the one that's been tuned on that 1 million instructions, it'll give you a plain language description of what's actually happening in this C code. Okay, so this is essentially what's going on with prompting. We give these models like a little bit of text in, they give us a little bit of text out, um, and that's great. So we can ask it a question like, who's my boss? Who's Jamie T. Van? And it'll say Jamie T. Van is a computer scientist and researcher at Microsoft Research, except for it turns out this is inaccurate. Um, because it's not that it hallucinated this, it's just that it's out of date. The model was trained on, I don't know, 2020 data, something like that. And since 2020, Jamie T. Van has moved out of Microsoft Research into a product part of the organization. She's now the chief scientist. Anyway, it doesn't have that stuff because the model wasn't trained on it. Um, it's also bad at math. If you ask it for the square root of 42, uh, it'll tell you six. And anybody who can multiply six by six knows that that is not 42. Um, and so anyway, so there are these things that the models are bad at, but you can give them text, they give you text back. Okay, so let's talk about things that show up in the literature as making these models smarter. So chain of thought is one of the strategies that people use to make the models do things in a somewhat more intelligent way. I'm gonna zoom in on this graphic so we can kind of see how that goes. So standard prompting, you might show the model an example. So you're, you're asking a math problem. Roger has five balls, buys two mark hands tennis balls. Each has three balls each. How many does he have now? Uh, okay, so the answer is 11. Now we're gonna give GPT. So we show it like, hey, you can do question and answer. Now we're gonna give you a new question. We, we expect you to give us the answer. And it turns out it doesn't do very good at this. It doesn't do very good at doing math. But if you show it how to think through a math problem before you ask it to then solve a math problem, it will then think through the math problem and it is much more accurate in actually doing the math correctly. And so I've done my own examples of this where I try to show GPT some, some uh, strategies for getting a square root and then ask it to follow a similar, similar strategy for getting a root, square root. Still not exactly right, but does a much better job of, of guessing where the actual square root of 42 is, which is uh, not 6.45, but it's a lot closer to 6.45 than it is 6. Okay, so I wanna show you another thing that comes out the, of the literature, which is giving GPT tools that it can use, such as calculators and search functions and that sort of stuff. So essentially the idea is that you, you give GPT a prompt, uh, it produces some output, but then you stick that, that output back on the end of the prompt and then run the prompt again. And through this repeated process, you essentially let GPT think through its own outputs by being able to observe its own outputs. But the most important thing is that you can stick tools into this loop, like a calculator so that it can be good at math and a search feature so it can get more up-to-date information. And so there was this research paper, uh, the React paper, uh, synergizing reasoning and acting in language models that essentially developed what, what seems to be essentially the foundation for the state of the art in doing this sort of process. So essentially what you do is you structure a prompt, you give it some instructions, you tell it what tools it has to use, you give it a format that it should produce its output in and then tell it to go ahead. And so we're gonna, oh yeah, and this is, I generally connect this sort of to Python. Um, I wanted to call out one of the ways that we help GPT know that it's bad at math, 
where we actually tell it, you are GPT-3, you can't do math, you can do basic math, your memorization is good, but you can't do complex calculations. So instead, we want you to write us some Python that will do the math that you want to do so that you don't have to do the math. Essentially, this is what we're doing when we give it a calculator. So for example, when we tell it, hey, you're going to calculate the square root of 42, it tells us that, hey, I'd like you to run this Python for me. We run the Python, we get the output, we give it back to GPT, and then GPT can now use that output to know like, aha, okay, now I can actually uh, produce this answer accurately, even though I'm bad at math. And so essentially GPT is producing like, hey, run this Python for me, We're running the Python and then giving that back to GPT. I wanted to make that clear about what's happening here. Uh, so essentially this allows GPT to now be good at math because it can call it to a calculator function when it needs to do it. Let's look at another example. Um, Oh, actually, before I dig into this, I want to dig into um, essentially when people are trying to make sense of information, they go through this process that's relatively well described in the search literature um, called information foraging. Uh, foraging, you know, like looking around for berries in a forest, you know, is sort of a general human process. Applying that process to how people gather information when they're using search feature and that sort of stuff matches pretty well. Essentially, people start with a query, but they don't quite know exactly what they're going for because it turns out from the first, the results of the first query, they learn something new and they write a second query that's informed by the results of the first query. Then they might write a couple more queries to get more results. Eventually, they learned enough about what they were looking for where they can write the, run the right query to get the information that they actually needed at the start. They, didn't, they couldn't have written query five at the start because they didn't know enough to, to write query five. That's really what I wanna make clear. They sort of learn as they go as they're gathering information. Anybody who's dug through library materials to learn about a subject is familiar with this sort of process. Well, LLMs can actually follow this process too. GPT can follow this process. And that's essentially what we're doing when we give GPT access to a search feature. So let's ask GPT a hard information question. What's the relationship between Jamie T. Van and Brent Hatch? That's essentially my manager and the person who runs my organization at Microsoft. Um, so the first thing that GPT wants to do is it wants to run a search for Jamie T. Van and Brent Hecht. And it can even output thoughts that it has, whoops, thoughts that it has throughout the process, such as I want to search uh, files and emails for the relationship between Jamie T. Van and Brent Hecht. So anyway, we run that search, we get the output, we stick it back into the prompt. That's that loop that I was just showing you earlier. We ask it, what else do you need? Now it's like, oh, I want to, I want to search your emails for Jamie T. Van and Brent Hecht. Cool. We run that search. We put that back in the prompt. Now it says, I want to run a search again, but now I want to search for the Office of Applied Research because it saw something about the Office of Applied Research in the first search that it ran. And it turns out that's my office. Jamie and Brent both work in that office. Um, and so now it thinks that it's got enough information about Jamie T. Van and Brent Hecht and it can produce an answer. And so we ask it to produce an answer and cite its work and it produces something that looks like this. Jamie T. Van and Brent Hecht uh, both work in the Office of Applied Research team that brings together a whole bunch of research, blah, 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 blah. Jamie T. Van is the chief scientist and technical fellow. Brent is the director of applied science. This office offers grants to collaborate with universities on productivity research. And so you can see how we get a, a much more well-cited answer about a complicated question when we allow the system to essentially follow this foraging process of running multiple searches and learning from the results of each search as it goes. I wanted to call this out uh, largely, uh, actually, I'm gonna skip this. I wanted to call this out largely because this allows large language models to solve the kind of problems that, for example, Stephen was bringing up, that the model sort of doesn't know some things that weren't in its training data. And you kind of can't tell where that information came from. As you can see in this example, it was doing research and then citing the research that it gathered as it went. So this approach is really good when we're we're unclear about the information need when we start. When you start writing an article, you are unclear about your information need. Either that or you're just going to write the entire article as like a, a single thought. Um, nobody ever does that because you sort of learn about the article as you write the article and so, just as somebody learns as they do searches. And where there's high stakes about being wrong, we need the results of the information gathering process to be citable. Um, and preferably, we'd also like it to be explainable. We'd like to be able to understand, like, how did the system arrive at the result that it did? What was it thinking, if you will, along the way? Remember, it is just outputting the next word as it goes, but it can output things that look like thoughts. And so it can sort of show you why it's taking, why it thinks it's taking the steps that it's taking. 
And of course, in places where there's a high level of term and concept amb ambiguity, and for to just put this in layman's terms, think of disambiguation pages. Sometimes it's hard to know what we're talking about. And so getting that right is really hard. You kind of have to go through an iterative information gathering process to know that this John Smith is different from this other John Smith and how that John Smith is different. Okay, so one last thing that I want to show you is uh, agents, which is essentially we can uh, make this much more complex to make these processes more powerful. So I showed you the example where we just ask the, the uh, LLM a question and we have it output the answer. And it's great. It gives us a nice fluent answer. It's really fast. It's easy to engineer something like this. But it only knows stuff that was in the public crawl. And as of the date that the, the model was trained, it lacks any sort of grounding and citation. It can hallucinate all over the place. Um, it's really hard to tell if it's done anything wrong. And so we can essentially have the system go through one step. So it plans some searches, it does those searches, it generates an answer, and that works really well, uh, except for it only works with basic questions if we only let it do one round of searches. If it, was, if it would learn something interesting or important from the first search, it can't use that in the second search. So let's let it do this iterative uh, looping search. So this is essentially the React loop that I was just showing you. Um, we can get fluent answers out of this. The answers can be drowned in uh, grounded with citations. We get iterative planning, this sort of search refinement pattern that happens as people forage or as they're gathering information to write an article. Of course, it takes more language model calls and it turns out language models are, are slow. Um, and it can only really provide direct answers to immediate questions. So really the research that I'm doing right now, what I'd argue is sort of state of the art is combining this sort of iterative information gathering process with information literacy processes, planning and reflecting on like what information am I actually gathering? And just to give you a sneak peek, I'm not gonna dig into this, but a lot of my work is around how you get a language model to surface its assumptions so that it can check those assumptions with searches on the internet or whatever information you can gather from. So when it eventually produces an answer with citations, it's checked its assumptions along the way. Okay, so essentially what I want to argue is uh, on, the, on the spectrum of writing Wikipedia where humans do all the work and machines write Wikipedia by themselves, before the language model revolution, we were kind of still pretty far on the left of having bots help us. And they were doing relatively rudimentary things to help us write Wikipedia. Um, and with the LLM revolution, we've moved a lot closer where we can have these sort of GPT-4, which is, you know, arguably one of the most advanced uh, language models right now, these sort of foragers with access to library content can get us pretty close to writing Wikipedia articles by themselves, but not entirely there. I think the, the LLM policy is a great example about this. Are we five years, 20 years from this? It's really hard to say. Honestly, I don't know, but we're essentially going in this sort of direction. So with my last minute here, I just wanted to give you a sense for what I see as like the future of writing Wikipedia with language models. So I kind of think of the world as reference documents. You can think of these as reliable sources, secondary and tertiary sources, journal articles, news articles, that sort of stuff. We have generated content, but we essentially want to put this curation wall between anything that actually shows up in the encyclopedia. So we can get suggested new articles and we can su get suggested edits. And I want to give you a sense for what that might look like. So a suggested article might be you show up with a general topic, a Wikidata item, maybe a little bit of reference material that you already know exists. You give this to a forager, a forager goes looks around and gathers more reference material and figures out how to summarize your reference material plus the reference material it can find and produces an, a suggested article with references and some process that explains how it got to that article content. A human comes and curates that and then they can publish that, maybe adds another reference, maybe add some more content, maybe clean up what the machine did. This can dramatically improve the rate at which content is generated in a way that looks like an encyclopedia article and looks like an encyclopedia article building process. Similarly, we can suggest edits when, say, a new uh, textbook comes out, a new uh, news article, a new journal article. With a little bit of computer science magic, we can figure out what, whoops, uh, what, what articles that was relevant to. We can run the forager plus that new reference material on the article, and it can suggest edits or determine that no suggested edit is necessary. And I feel like this is something that we're likely to see in Wikipedia in the next year or two, or at least I would be building this right now if I didn't have other work that people were paying me to do. Um, all right, that's all I have for you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, can you disable your screen sharing? Awesome. Um, well, that was a whirlwind overview and just what I was hoping for. Um, let's get into the kind of back and forth discussion in a little 
fuzzier questions. Um, so the first one is uh, kind of with the first current crop of AI tools, like in terms of what to expect from them and how they fail, um, like I'm, I've been spending some time trying to find kind of what are the right mental models and metaphors for how they work. And the one I turn to most is from an essay by Ted Chang, where he describes ChatGBT as a blurry JPEG of the web. So it's kind of taken in a whole lot of training data from crawling the whole web, from books, from Wikipedia, from Reddit discussion forums. And then it kind of compresses that into patterns and cobbles together its output from those patterns, similarly to how like a super compressed JPEG uses the repeating patterns in a source image to kind of encode a recognizable but blurry version of that original, but like all the fine details have been lost. Um, so that's kind of my favorite one. But what mental models or metaphors do you use uh, when thinking about or discussing AI? And in the chat, uh, toss them out too, because I'm sure there are lots. Any panelists want to take a crack? Well, I would jump in and say that it what we're talking a lot about now is that um, in terms of how we think about writing and how we teach writing is that uh, much writing will in office formats, perhaps and productivity formats become rewriting and that we can already foresee that many of our students are going to go into job context, employment context, where they're asked to produce writing and the, the writing that they produce, they may rather than start by looking at a blank screen they're, to write a sales report, they'll say, you know, let me have a sales report. And then they will get a sales report and then they will have to review it and correct the mistakes and insert the relevant data. And so that uh, analogy is that writing is becoming rewriting is something that we're talking a lot more about. I'm also really interested in some of the things that Aaron was talking about because it's very thought-provoking. Um, one of the major challenges that we've had with AI or generative AI is the explainability problem. And so, I mean, you know, fundamentally, I feel like if you can't, if I, speaking for myself, if I can't explain something, then I can't teach something. And so that makes so much of what's happening under the hood with AI inaccessible um, and to see Aaron's presentation and to look at this 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 model where you're continually refining and if you can make those refined searches visible, um, then it seems like there's 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 more of the scaffolding is now accessible to the humans in the loop, and so that's a, that's a really interesting um, model for me to think about. Aaron. Yeah, so I, I dumped this into the chat, but I, it was, it's always helpful to type out something out before I say it out loud. But I like to think about GPT as a, a freeze-dried graduate student. Freeze-dried in that you can just call on it at any moment and it thaws out and does something for you. But a graduate student in that it's an incredibly knowledgeable system. Um, and if you ask it a direct question and don't give it access to any resources, it knows a lot. But those those memories are partial and incomplete and and sometimes mistaken um as they would with with any human who doesn't have uh, a photographic memory um but if you give that graduate student access to information resources they know how to use them to check their memory to to fill in the gaps to to learn new things um and so so like a lot of what i do in engaging with gpt is ask myself like if i was instructing a graduate student to go through a uh, 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 informa uh, uh, a process that has strong information literacy, what would that coaching look like? And then engage with the, the model in that way. And so a lot of the, the work that I do is thinking through in, in um, language model programming, they call it a chain of thought process. But really, this would be like a set of instructions that you might give to a student who's in an information literacy course. Like, I want you to first write down your assumptions, then think through how you might check those assumptions. And uh, after you've done that list, write down a list of questions that you have in this sort of information space and come up with a plan about how you're going to gather information about that. Then I want you to reflect on the information that you've gathered and apply maybe some rules to like think about how reliable that information is. Then write yourself a summary with references about what you did. That's exactly what I asked GPT to do. And so I'm not asking it actually to use its world knowledge exactly. 
um, its world knowledge is handy, I'm asking it to use its common sense, its ability to reason through a problem. And that's that's one of the ways that we get sort of uh, departure from uh, the blurry JPEG of the internet or the stochastic parrots that just predicts the next word, because I'm asking it to reflect on what it just did and come up with a plan for what to do next. Surprisingly good at that and gets around a lot of the problems that we run into with ungroundedness, unexplainable behavior. It, you know, the report that it writes me after it does a foraging process looks like what, what you would have a student do if you asked them to show their work. Well, I'll, I'll just hop on that. I, I do. I like this metaphor of chat GPT or AI as like the overly eager grad or research assistant, grad student research assistant. And I think one one way that that kind of works is the, the politeness of the content that comes out of chat GPT. A lot of people say that that's actually a way that you can identify content that's AI generated is it seems very polite, seems very eager. Maybe, maybe that'll change. And, you know, that's something for us to think about whether we want necessarily that to end up on on Wikipedia. Um, and I just say I put this out to um to the readers of my newsletter and my high school English teacher wrote back and she said that she's already starting to use the metaphor of chat GPT as like a calculator um, in the same way that the you know high school math teacher is designing a test that you know just having the calculator doesn't mean you're going to get a perfect score she and uh, you know other humanities teachers at the high school level are thinking about designing the assignment in a way that it's not uh, not just something that chat GPT can help a student get an A plus on and, you know, I think that really speaks to Bob's point about how a lot of writing, not, not just at the college, but at the high school level, is it's it's going to become a rewriting uh, and that the students are going to use chat GPT maybe in the first instance. Um, one, one thing that I sort of was provoked by um, actually just this morning um, from a, a long time uh, Wikipedian um, was um, this idea that actually you know, we've we've trained these models um, in part using humans um, doing click work type tasks where they're they're trying to you know feed in the the uh, the data that will be an example for these chat systems to follow. But now that these chat systems exist, as we want more and more of this sophisticated training data from from humans doing some real thinking, um, these tools are now actually available to mechanical Turk workers uh, to to take shortcuts themselves and and, you know, provide some training data that, in fact, actually comes from chat GPT um, and is sort of starting to muddle the distinction between um, like the information foraging behavior and sort of the, the role of uh, people in rewriting what's going on and the role of the sources that are coming back. Does is that something that uh, sort of should really change our thinking about these or is that kind of a, a a flash in the pan i'm especially curious to get your uh, opinion on how much uh this is an existential threat to the future of ai aaron <laughs> yeah so so honestly i don't i don't think it's that much of a threat uh the the um yeah, the 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 thing that I'm mo so so this is there, there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion. I don't know if there's a ton of research, but at least some about what this is doing to the the creator economy, which I guess Wikipedia is a part of, but uh, more so in that that people create content online and make money from that. A lot of people make a make a living from that. And if you if if creating content becomes super easy and you can create a lot of garbage that people will click on and read and whatever, then uh, this becomes this becomes a really big problem. And so I think that uh, there's there's a really strong incentive for creators who are who are not who are at least curating what they get out of a language model to uh, differentiate themselves from uh, people who are doing primarily automated content creation. Um, and I think that that will benefit the future of of training these sort of models. Um, but that said, like I, I I do think that you know like this this has uh, has always been a problem with training models that we have automation that that feeds back into the systems. It generally causes less problems than you might expect um, because it sounds pretty terrible to feed model output back into the system. Um, but but it it works out pretty well in practice. You know, just to, to further like um, uh, the point is, I, I bet you Wikipedia is going to be one of those places that's going to be highly differentiated as at least highly curated, if not purely human produced. 
And so Wikipedia will remain one of those amazing sources of data for machine learning models. And I don't see that going away. The thing that I'm more worried about is um, changing the, the, the valuableness of the, the article itself. You know, in a lot of ways, these models are filling in a role that Wikipedians have filled entirely by themselves. You know, do we want Wikipedians to move to the mode? Do we want content creators as a whole, whether they're Wikipedians or not, to move to the mode of curators and purely curators as opposed to producers? Um, I'm not sure that's right. And it sounds a lot like the discussion that I remember back in the day when bots first started uh, like cleaning up typos and that sort of stuff in articles that do we want to clean, take up all the, take all the typo fixing away from humans because typo fixing is an easy way to get started in Wikipedia. Arguably writing a, a stub article is also a relatively easy way to get started in Wikipedia. It's a common way to get started in Wikipedia anyway. And it seems like these things are going to take away from the sort of like lower hanging fruit content production uh, processes. And so anyway, I see this as sort of like a trade off of like, humans don't necessarily want this, or at least they want it corralled. And therefore, AIs or AI developers will also probably benefit from that corralling. Awesome. Thank you. Um, one of the kind of worry areas when it comes to the future of Wikipedia and AI is um, like, will AI actually kind of make Wikipedia itself obsolete. So one story about the initial success of Wikipedia comes down to convenience. Like the reason it developed such a massive audience, which fueled the growth of its editing community and essentially displaced traditional encyclopedias is not necessarily because it was simply a better encyclopedia than Britannica, but it was good enough for most of the people at the time and it was far more convenient. So it covered a lot more of what people were interested in and you could just get it right on the web, super easy. Uh, so one risk in my mind is that gener generative AI becomes the quick, convenient way of getting your factual questions answered. And the results might be significantly less accurate than Wikipedia, but like they're packaged in a concise way. It's just the, the answer to the question you asked, not the 30 minute read of the fully detailed Wikipedia article. So does that big leap forward in convenience pose an existential threat to Wikipedia's role in the information ecosystem? I like the question, Sage. I'm thinking about it. I don't, I don't have crystal balls, so I can't tell you the answer. Uh, I did put one of my favorite quotes from Yokai Winkler in the uh, chat. It makes kind of the same point about convenience. Um, but I also think the opposite is possibly true, that if we continue to have inaccuracies in generative AI outputs and those continue to become more common, it might drive readers to seek human uh, imprimaturs to make sure that uh, they, they, they know that there's a human on the other side of what they're reading. That's another possibility in how this plays out. And that, I think, would continue to drive up the value of Wikipedia content as it is now mostly created, because we can go to Wikipedia and mostly believe that we're seeing human curated content. Uh, to the extent to which that human created co curated content is interacting with AI, uh, we don't know, but I'm not as concerned because I believe in the editing process generally as, as Wikipedia has worked. So it may end up driving up the value of the current process. And as we continue to uh, figure out what the tool's strengths and weaknesses are, and we're able to devise ways to be transparent about how we're engaging those tools, I think that um, there's, there's, a, there's a possibly sunny future as well. I don't know. Yeah, I do, I do think there's a concern that, you know, if if the go-to source for information becomes chat gpt and wikipedia just gets get driven further and further into the background um you know i guess if there's a cause for optimism that there was a group of us that worked on a book wikipedia at 20 and in just about every chapter someone was talking about the existential threat to wikipedia and you know the many reported deaths of wikipedia and so there in the past there have been you know uh, so many concerns that this is the the last hour for wikipedia and and, and so maybe that 
that is just uh, suggests that Wikipedia will continue even in this generative AI era. Uh, it, it might add, to Bob's point, it might add, if there's a cause for optimism, a reason that some people want to contribute to Wikipedia, that they want to train the AI, and that the, at least for the people that know that, um, it kind of gives a new motivation to contribute to Wikipedia and uh, for the people that understand its importance. I have a very computer science uh, response to this, which is, so Google is an index. You know, it, it indexes, uh, it, in a very basic way, it indexes the words on the internet. So you can type a search of words and it'll find documents that have words that are like those words and return them to you. Wikipedia is an al also an index. This is, this is discussed often when people talk about citing Wikipedia, that Wikipedia is actually an index to the reference material so that you can, you can understand, put the reference material into context, and then use it when you want to actually cite, cite a source. Um, and I, I think that in general, indexes are really important to what I've shown you with, with foraging processes that, uh, um, you know the the fact that uh, there is there's like a debate in or around like a you know like Wikipedia has a lot of policies about how you report on reliable sources, especially when they disagree. If there's like a debate among reliable sources and authorities, then you should report that that debate, that disagreement, um, and that reporting of that 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 nuance in the the content that's relevant to a certain concept or an idea indexes a really important thing that if a, if a language model were to try and work that out, it would be extremely, comp they would essentially need to write the article from scratch in order to identify like, ah, yeah, okay, there's some sources that disagree on something substantial here. You know, if I'm, I'm going to use that information, I need to consider that. You know, Wikipedians do that sort of work all the time. Having access to those sort of things is really, really important. There might be a day where, um, these language models are writing the entirety of Wikipedia, and so they're writing their own indexes. But I, I feel like that's that's pretty darn far out. That I, I would expect to see that Wikipedians are still doing very hard work to make the the index and encyclopedia quality index function in in the the time of language models. And so anyway, so, so that's to say, like, I think that language models are going to do a really good job of serving immediate information needs. They're going to draw from something that looks like Wikipedia in order to do so. And so Wikipedia might narrow a little bit in where it provides value to information gathering. I just don't think that information gathering will be as easy as it needs to be, or that we'll be able to cut Wikipedia uh, and Wikipedia-like things so far out of information gathering processes that... LLMs will continue to be easy long term. You know, we might we might swing in the direction of like, oh, LLMs are easy now. Let's ignore Wikipedia, and then they're going to get crappy because <laughs> they don't have the in one of the most important indexes that they need. And then we'll go put time and energy into that. Hopefully, go put time and energy into that index so that we have good information again. I think that's much more likely than us ditching Wikipedia. Um. Well, that's. A uh, lovely segue into my last prepared question before we turn to the Q&A. Um, and this is maybe a, a quick hit that I think Aaron hinted at, a uh, possible answer from his perspective too. Um, but what would an ideal future of Wikipedia in an AI world look like? Like, should we hope for a Wikipedia that's better and more relevant than ever because of the way AI tools empower developers and Wikipedia editors? Or is there, um, kind of some other direction that you see of like, what's the most hopeful situation you can envision? And what future should we kind of be working towards and trying to, you know, make sure happens rather than going off the rails in, in worse ways? Well, I, I can start here. You know, we haven't talked too much about the other language editions of Wikipedia. And I should say, when I write an article, I almost always get an email from someone that's, that points to another, because there, there are almost 300 different language editions of Wikipedia. And I think that the AI tools could could help with um, providing content in those other languages and and, and serving those communities. Um, I'd say, I uh, here, I, there was a great Washington Post article about how Gen Z is dropping the Google search. And you know, I was, I've been thinking about that ever since, but I, I do think there's an opportunity to add some AI tools to Wikipedia that could help with searching that maybe could point to reliable sources. And, um, you know, we'd want to think about how those are implemented, but that, that could help serve editors in the Wikipedia editing process. And so I, I you know, I'm thinking a lot about um, Aaron's chart of like human driven to 
uh, to a machine written encyclopedia, but I'd still like to see a human centered encyclopedia that um, that benefits where the editors have um, the benefit of these AI tools to help them. And, um, you know, I think hopefully we're trending in that direction. You know, I, I mean, personally, I'll, I'll be uh, very honestly, um, you know, when I think about humanity and the future of humanity, I wish we could put this one back in the box. Um, mm. You know, like this, this uh, LLMs are, are going to not, not be great for us in the, the short term, um, medium term, maybe even long term. Um, but when I put on my, my you know, uh, scientist and engineer hat, these are one of the coolest technologies. They, they offer so many possibilities. Like when I think about my my work as a tool developer for Wikipedians, like oh, so many things I can do, so many things that I can help with, so many so many things that I, that I can make easier with this. And and uh, since we can't put this back in the box, that's that's what I really want to see. I would like to see we could, like I, I essentially imagine my work in the past building machine learning models for Wikipedians as giving them super suits that they could they could crawl around Wikipedia dealing where those super suits made dealing with the most annoying problems so easy and fast that they weren't annoying problems anymore. Um, now, now I think these super suits are moving from dealing with annoying problems so that they're not annoying problems anymore to helping with some of the, the most exciting work that you do in Wikipedia. Um, you know, anybody who's who's uh, seen my research in the past uh, will know that I, I advocate for like a very uh, human centric approach in the development of these technologies, like sit down with Wikipedia and ask them like, what's hard? What's an opportunity here? Let's try and see if we can do that. Let's try it. Let's see. Does it work the way that you expected? Should we take a different direction? If we can do that and put put the, the most powerful aspects of these tools in the hands of Wikipedians, I don't know where that's going to bring us, but I think that that's the right road to be on. Um, one where Wikipedians have the, the most power in shaping the direction that the, the wiki goes. Um, and I would expect that, you know, just like the turn to wiki data for structured data, Wikimedians broadly might take a turn towards something that's not exactly articles that will also be great for Wikipedia if we put the tools in their hands. The, the, the only risk that I really see of Wikipedia getting left behind is if we don't put the best tools in Wikipedia's hands. We don't give them the opportunities that say large corporations ha that have access to lots of money so they can run these language models at scale have. You know, I'd really like to see these models become so cheap, so easily available that any Wikipedian can run, you know, a hundred millions, I'm gonna say millions of requests to these language models without worrying about cost or speed or anything like that in the same way that big corporations can run millions of requests without cost or speed. And so anyway, I'm not really answering your question. I'm saying how we get to a good version of the answer to your question. Awesome, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, get to some of the Q&A now. Um, and one of the questions that I think a lot of people in the chat are really interested in is, um, what should a university's policy on the use of AI by students be? Um, so I think there could be a lot of possible opinions about this, but I know Bob, you've actually had some experience looking at what is actually going into place at different universities and maybe you can speak to some of the approaches that are in the wild and then if Aaron and Stephen have uh, some some chip shots to throw in afterwards. I, I, we've seen everything. Um, again, we've seen uh, people who are calling for it to be banned, uh, people who stubbornly refuse to believe that it, there's not an automatic generative AI detector. Uh, we've had repeated calls for our university to purchase this non-existent technology. Um, and we have people that are fully embracing it. So what we've done on our campus is try to respect the divergence of faculty approaches and enable faculty to make the right decisions for their classrooms. So, you know, what I do in my writing classroom, is very different than what somebody does in a 200 person chemistry seminar um, or what they do in the chemistry lab. So different situations with different learning goals, uh, I think the faculty can um, customize their approaches. That's but that's been our approach. Um, and uh, it's it's I think it's probably the only approach is to respect faculty a faculty led process where faculty can be as informed as possible and then make decisions about what goes on in their classroom. And 
the general academic honesty, dishonesty context, which is you're responsible for your own work, um, it, it can be adapted, in my opinion, to fit generative AI context with just a little bit of care and attention. Stephen, Aaron, did you want to uh, add anything? Here? Yeah, well, I, I can't speak to the university setting really, but I just say in journalism and maybe particularly the kind of journalism I do, I think that there's some interesting applications to chat GPT. Just for one, one example, I've written a few times about RFCs, requests for comments in the Wikipedia community, or particularly, you know, thorny policy debates. And sometimes there'll be, you know, 200 people who chime in or, you know, um, or the discussion of a reliable source, the reliable source policy has been going on for 20 years. And I'm wondering if ChatGPT could help, you know, with summarizing that kind of picking out key strands and, and kind of, you know, helping, helping the, the journalist really identify things that they might not identify just on their first read. So it's not so much the writing, it's, it's a research application. You know, like uh, my my own small view into uh, um, you know the education space is is uh, like just thinking about how you know I was I was arguing before like how would I coach a grad student to do X? I'm going to coach the LLM to do do its work in the same way, um, and I I really I, I really think that that's a valuable thing to to um, to pair with with coursework. So for example, if I had I had a, a student uh, and we were covering material related to information literacy, I would want them to play with different versions of the forager that I was demonstrating earlier when I showed some slides. Um, maybe a version of the forager that uses less high quality information literacy approaches versus one that uses much more robust information literacy approaches. And watching the model go through its process might be very informative to students. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of opportunities beyond, I, I wanted to call this out because it's an opportunity that's beyond just writing support, where uh, maybe we can actually encode expertise or at least expert process into, into uh, these models behavior and let students play with that in order to adopt or refine those kind of processes themselves. Um, yeah, I think that's, a, that's an interesting opportunity that I don't see explored very much right now, or at least I haven't heard about. Awesome. Uh, I think we have time for one more question and one that uh, people in this chat are excited about is from Matt Vetter, which brings us back to thinking about kind of the labor relations underlying this. So what are some of the implications for Wikipedia and other data contributors um, in terms of their motivation if these LLMs like ChatGPT4 are monetized and building off of Wikipedia dependent on it, but um, like are not directly now sort of like people of not using Wikipedia directly, but they're fueling these these big and very profitable or not yet profitable, but possibly profitable uh, machines. Like what's in it for Wikimedia contributors to give their time to the project only for it to be commodified downstream? You know, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't know why it's legal for GPT to essentially recapitulate Wikipedia content without citing the source. I'm pretty sure that the the uh, the license says that you can't do that. Um, and I would really, I, you know, like I was saying earlier, like I'd love to put it back in the box and I don't think that you can, but that's one of the ways that you could put it back in the box is sue them, <laughs> take them to, to copyright court. I, again, not a lawyer, not sure if that would work, but I, I would I would love to see that. And I feel like that hits on these sort of notes that there's a reason why Wikipedia has a share alike license. And these models aren't share alike. In fact, even their outputs aren't share alike. And I just don't see how that works. Like, why isn't this license being applied? I would really like to see it applied. And I think that might address some of these these issues. Yeah, and I don't really have an answer to the economic question, except that I think that it's a problem, right? It's a problem with where only people who have you know sufficient financial resources or free time are able to contribute, and that the big tech companies are are getting so much value from Wikipedia. Then you know that that raises an issue. You know how how are they giving back to Wikipedia financially? But then you also want to make sure that there's no influence on content from the big tech companies. So it's it's just a really thorny issue, the economics of of Wikipedia. I mean, to me, the answer is obvious. You just forcibly nationalize all these tech companies. 
uh, and and then uh, set them up as you know building something that is uh, explicitly for uh, the public good. But I I haven't had super amount of success um, getting that enacted yet yet. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we're at the time, so if anyone else wanted to have one last thing to say, panelists, um, now's your chance. And thank you so much. Uh, this has been a great discussion and I've learned a lot and we will have a recording up um, as soon as we can process it. And thank you so much, uh, those of you in the chat. And uh, thank you for those who asked questions and especially those that we didn't get to answer. We, if we, um, if we had more time, we would answer all of them. Great questions. Thank you, everyone.